This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Welcome, Talk Catholic, the website.com, your host, Tim Kilcoyne. No agendas here, just the straight and narrow, through Mary to Jesus, the Catholic faith proclaimed and preserved. Hope to see you here every week. TalkCatholic.com with Tim Kilcoyne as we start a new school year, no? Don't forget the last words of last week's show. Truth matters. You can refer all your classmates to this show every Saturday. And it's not my truth. It's the truth. Or it's not truth at all. Well, we have a gentleman, one of the holiest priests in my lifetime, who has been all about the truth relative to the pro-life movement. Oh, is this not what we need to hear more about as we approach another election? Our first Saturday interview is with Father Frank Pavone. Indeed, Father Frank Pavone. And don't forget the five first Saturdays. I'm finishing up my five right here today. Go to confession, say the rosary, meditate 15 minutes on a mystery of the rosary, and go to mass and receive communion and throw in a little work of charity along the way. That's it. And Our Lady will remember you when evil goes after you one last time upon your departure. Not life-changing, eternity-changing. And now I think I hear a bell ringing from heaven itself. Father Frank Pavone. Hello, this is Father Frank. Tim Kilcoyne of WQPH Radio 89.3 FM up here in northern Massachusetts. It is an honor, an honor like no other. I should let you know, I met you years ago at a new evangelization conference down in Dallas, Texas. I had a little booth. Okay. <laughs> I was uh-huh. right next to you. <laughs> well, look at that. I had a program called the Catholic Kitchen Table, an adult ed program for parish life and fairways to faith using golf for evangelization. And uh, what, I'm telling you, I didn't know at the time, you know, uh, you weren't as prominent. Uh, I didn't know what a great man of God, and I don't want to overly flatter, but I must, because on the day, uh, well, it was about three or four days before you got uh, such wicked news, as far as I'm concerned, out of the Vatican, I had made a comment on, on my radio show that if, if there were three Catholics in my lifetime, that I would rank, <laughs> not that we should do any ranking, but as the greatest witness of the Catholic faith in my lifetime, I would put them as Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, Mother Mary Angelica, and yes, indeed, Father Frank Pavone. And, oh, and, thank you so much. And, that means a lot. And, and, and it's a simple litmus test, by their fruits ye shall know them. Yeah, and isn't that right? That's isn't it. Isn't that right? That, that's absolutely how I look at it. And uh, I want you, uh, you know, we could go all over the place here, but here's something a little different that I want you to really help the listeners to try to understand. Because we're, we're in unprecedented territory right now, it seems, relative to what's going on in the church, what's going on in our country, et cetera. Uh, just a, a lack of leadership, let's just call it, where they... Um, especially in our church, where there's an unwillingness to address concrete issues that affect family life in your neighborhood, in your state, your county, etc. They, If you listen to the overwhelming majority of the sermons today, there's just, it's almost like they've got it down to a science where they'll refer to the scriptures of 2,000 years ago, but that's the extent of it. And then there'll be a few right. words about the importance of prayer in your life. And then we move right. on. And there's absolutely yeah. there's zero correlation to what's happening like right now in this life where I am. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, uh, you well, know. yeah, I think I think you hit the nail on the head as to what the problem is. You know, and it's not even that they don't believe. It, 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 it's that they're unwilling to connect the dots. I know. And they might say something. Anything they do say, yeah. you know, like in terms of well, what does this mean for our life? 
lies, yep. it ends up being so generic. It's like, well, we've got to love more. Exactly. And we've got to, you know, yep. and you know, remember we have to we have to follow the Lord in everything we do. It's like, well, but, but what does that mean? You have to translate it for people. Exactly. <laughs> you, 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 you know, I've spent a lot of time with the high schoolers, the seventeen year olds, okay, and you know the seventeen year old he, he wants meat and potatoes. He wants right. real concrete answers to tough questions that he has right now. And they and they I, I was a regular guy god forbid i mean I, i'm right with them and i tell them here's what the church actually teaches it's in a book called the catechism and 97 percent don't even know what that book is and uh in one right. in one catholic pep school you know a, a lad was saying to me mr kilcoy where do you get all this stuff i said well it's in a book called the catechism but they right. they don't want to buy it for you freshman year like they do the bible Okay, but I think it's, it's I think this this is the key issue about could you explain to us what is the priest's responsibility in the area of faith and morals? How, where's the boundary? You know, obviously we don't go to you for, you know, auto mechanics, right? But tell us what you believe and because and the reason I'm I'm highlighting this is because it's my overwhelming belief that you got the kibosh because you went political, okay? Yeah. Let's not kid ourselves. We, we have a communist agenda at work in our church. It's a very quiet, subtle, sneaky kind of agenda that's been at work for decades. I'm a graduate of Boston College 1970s theology, so I know exactly where this stuff is coming from. And right. so they are highly political, okay, in their own right, but they may not publicize it. They're not holding press conferences, but then look what they do to you. Could you could you yeah, give us some exactly. clarification on this? Exactly. What I did, I went I went online. I have my daily broadcasts on endabortion TV. Yep. And so I went online and I put on the table. You may have seen this broadcast a stack several feet high <laughs> of documents. Yep. Uh, from all my back and forth with the Vatican and with the bishops and whatnot. And I said to the people, just you know, with all due humility and respect, I said to the people, listen. I've lived through this the last 21 years. Right. It's been a 21 years of battling, yep. you know, trying to do my work to save babies, but meanwhile they make it into a battle. Yeah. And I said, I know exactly why they did this. Yep. And, and this is this is back and forth. This is clear. And yes, you're you're right. It's the you know the political stuff when you connect the dots a little bit too much for people. Yep. And uh, you know they said to me, oh, you have to stop being so political. I said, well, you tell me <laughs> how we proclaim the gospel, yep. how we teach the teachings of the church about the unborn right. and how do you do that in a way that doesn't make you seem like you're favoring the political party exactly. that happens to be saying the same thing that we have to be protecting the unborn yep. how do you do that exactly and of course they've never been able to explain it to me right because it's impossible you know, <laughs> you, you, the only way that you you know because they literally they come out with these memos and i quote them in my my book yeah. abolishing abortion yeah. you know they send out these memos that say you can't even appear to be favoring one party's position or another. Now they just position. They didn't even say candidate. They say position. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, one party has a pro-life position, one party has a pro-abortion position. Yeah. You tell me how we're supposed to navigate this when we're a pro-life church. Exactly. Exactly. It, 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 no, it, 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 it does, there's no common sense at all. And what bothers me the most, because I firmly believe I mean, look at it, I've been I've been at this like yourself many many years. I father, I haven't heard. I don't think I can count on my hand, okay, the number of clergy that said three good words about free market enterprise, okay? Right. Free market. Right. So therefore, what's the implication of that, <laughs> okay? Right. right. No, they're absolutely being political and they're being political in their silence right now over yeah. the last how many years now right it's a political yeah. it's really a political statement by just not talking to the issues is it not yeah it is because the other side is talking to them very loud and clear exactly. you know for sunday being proclaimed transgender visibility by right. the so-called catholic president exactly. and you know yep. uh, the same man and his administration going on reproductive rights tours yep. and the boy vice president visiting an abortion facility Brutal. it's like if they're doing this yep. so in the face of 
you know, the Catholic public, the American public. Yep. And the church and the in, in the in the person of the bishops yep. sits back and doesn't say anything. Well, then how, you know, uh, what I always say is when the church speaks up and calls out that kind of behavior yes. and, and, and is rightly critical of it and says this is a violation of the faith and of the gospel, yeah. that's not the church being political. No. That's the church being the church. Exactly. And, and that's exactly what you were asking before. It's like, what do we expect of priests? We expect them to be very, very clear. We expect them to be shepherds. And, and, and when, when there's an obstacle in the way, when there's a stumbling block in the way, when there's a scandal in the way, because that's what scandal means, it's a potential stumbling block for people who are trying to live the faith, uh, and others are trying are doing exactly the opposite, but right. claiming to live. Right. That's and, where the priest has to step in. And, and, and when our Lord is saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's, you know, he, clearly, he didn't put truth in there for no good reason, right? right. Truth and love go together. And when you hear the God, some of the readings or the intentions, oh my goodness, talk about vanilla, yeah. right? You know, I mean, there's never the word. I'm just listening for the word truth. You know, we got to be loving right. and merciful. But I never hear the word truth. It's my, un well, my, yeah. my it, am I off the wall in saying that the priest should be the moral voice of Christ in the world? Yes, that's what Christ himself is. And, you know, it's, it's like when the, when the Pope says, todos, 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 yes. everyone, everyone, yes. all people, welcome to the church. Right. You know, we hear that saying, him saying that constantly. Yeah. We also hear him saying, you know, it is God, uh, God's work is to forgive. Yes. Okay. Right. We accept that all. That is correct, except that here's the other part of the story that we're not hearing enough, and that is when todos mm -hmm. come to the church, what happens next? <laughs> exactly. I mean, what do they what do they come to hear? I mean, if the church is not some kind of, if the church is something specific, yes, which it has to be if you're going to say, please come to us, todos, everyone is welcome. Yes. Okay, welcome exactly to what? Right. The church is called together by the word of god the word ecclesia both in greek and in latin yeah. for church yeah. is a community called together by the word of god and we don't have to reinvent the wheel what the church is right the church has her own teaching right. about what she is right and so she's called together by the word which means this is the community of people who accept this word of god which teaches us what's right what's wrong which teaches us like you're saying the truth right. which maps out a way of life for us because you know in the early church the Christian community was called the way yes. with a cup of capital W. Exactly. It's a way of life. And exactly. It is a way of life. So, yeah. so if you're going to uh, invite people of all different ways of life, because they're included in the todos, right? Well, then, well, but, but they get, do, when they come to this way of life, they have to change the way of life, right? <laughs> and, and it's like that's a part of the message that is common sense, just like you said. Yeah. And that's a part of the message that is not being spoken. It, it, all we hear is the first half of it. Everyone is welcome. Of everyone who yes. as you are. Yeah, but God loves us as we are, but God loves us too much to let us stay the way we are. And, and it changes us. Exactly. It is, has to be conversion of the heart and the soul. Yes. For eternity. Yes. This is what right. we're all about, right? Salvation of souls, as my dad said, SOS, right? Save our souls. Yes. They've turned it into simply political social justice. I mean, it's like yes. a complete yes. aversion to the Ten Commandments. You know, when I was right. in, in these high schools with 17-year-olds or the adult education uh, forums, they, were, they loved a nice feisty little debate relative to the teachings of the church that's you know they were exactly. excited to come exactly. to my class for pete's sakes you know and like i say, i feel so sorry that they don't seem to get it that god's good people are waiting they're waiting just give them the food <laughs> you know oh, and they you know what they're waiting they're thirsting they're hungering and they deserve it they, i always remember something that uh, saint john paul ii said they're actually echoing saint paul the sixth yeah. Um, who, who said when they were talking about evangelization and catechesis, yeah. they, they both made the point that, look, the people of God have a right. It's not a favor that we're doing to them. Right, it's not, right. oh, well, Father Frank has this style and Father so-and-so has yeah. this style. Yeah. Pope Francis has one. No, no, no. It's not about us. Right. It's about them. Exactly. They have a right to hear the fullness of the word of God. You we right. therefore have a duty yeah. to convey it to them. John Paul II used the phrase, in all its rigor and vigor, 
uh, you know, you know, the whole thing. You can't be cafeteria Catholic. You're not choosing from the menu. Yep. You get the whole thing. And that goes back, actually, to something you said before. When you said Jesus is the truth. Right. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Right. Because truth is the person of Jesus Christ, right. well, then, therefore, you cannot dismember it. You cannot exactly. disconnect it. You cannot serve it up piecemeal. And, tr and, tr and, truth, and truth is charity. It is. It exactly. is it, truth and charity and love, charity. They go together. That I mean, the greatest thing you can do for a person is to tell them the truth about things, so they don't get lost. This is the greatest act of uh, agape that you can <laughs> that you can put yeah. forth. You know. Well, let's pause right there. What an honor that was, and we'll hear the second round. The first Saturday of October. This is WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. We'll get back to our book review with Mother Angelica's Answers, Not Promises. Well, we pray that our teachers will only teach the truth and nothing but, but we look for their friendship too, To Sir With Love by Lulu. Okay, we continue on in the chapter, Why Won't God Answer My Prayers? And we're talking now about the discernment of God's will. And boy, is there nothing more important than trying to get honed in to exactly that. In every individual life, I often have done a little segment on dreams versus God's will. Are they the same? Not necessarily. Let's listen to Mother. At EWTN, we encounter this challenge almost daily, discerning his will. Since we are almost always growing without financial means to pull it off, after much prayer, we might discern that God wants us to take on a monumental Project X. We say, okay, Lord, and proceed. The next day, we get hit by a dozen roadblocks, and the whole thing looks impossible. We say, help us, Lord, and he opens a few doors. We say, thank you, Lord. But it turns out that they're dead ends. Two months later, the whole thing blows up in our faces, and we see that the Lord was just trying to gain some time before we got engaged in the enterprise that ultimately reflected his will, his true will, which was monumental Project Y and Z. But the detour we took toward Project X actually prepared the groundwork for Y and Z without our realizing it. Remember, God acts in a completely free universe, and he will not interfere with the free will he gave us. So regardless of God's intent at the moment, if all of EWTN's business dealings were being changed and frustrated by other people, he would still respect their right to choose even against him. I can't imagine how difficult it might be to arrange an answer to a prayer that involved a lot of people, all of whom have free will. 
Now you know why you sometimes have to wait. And sometimes you will get an outright no. Again, it takes extraordinary trust to accept those much feared no's. When we pray for the healing of a sick child and the child dies, we would much prefer to think that God never heard us than to think that he said no. But if you pray to him, then he did hear you. And as tragic and painful as it might be, the truth, however incomprehensible, is that he allowed it because he knew he could bring a greater good from it. Again, in moments like these, our spiritual companions, faith, hope, and love, are crucial in toward growing in trust and peace of mind. We are so intellectually hamstrung because we can't see the world the way God sees it. We can't possibly know why things happen the way they do. We're like children to whom a loving parent must sometimes say, no, we must accept the fact that not everything we ask for is for our good, and that the only reason God might say no is because he wants to give something different and better. It is important that you patiently discern his will in the present moment. You must always remember that God's answer does not hinge on what you say or how you say it, or how deep your prayer life is. God answers all prayers, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. (laughs) Well, again, my mind goes back to a little lesson plan I often used to conduct on Field of Dreams, the movie. And this is where I very much got into this whole business of what you want to do versus what God wants you to do. And remember the movie, Ray Kinsella basically looks at having the dream of a major league career on the part of Moonlight Graham as so important to pursue. And again, in the most imaginative way, if you remember the part of the movie where he gets to meet Moonlight Graham, Doc Graham, now, later, and discovers that he was most content and happy as a doctor, and that his time in the major leagues was ever so short-lived by only getting to the bat one time, I believe. And Ray said to Moonlight, who he had, he had not been called that since his major league days, how can you stand it? You, you know, you had that kind of talent and you only got to bat once. And Moonlight looks at him and said, or Doc looks at him and says, had I not had the opportunity to become a doctor, that would have been a tragedy. So he recognized the moment of the fork in the road came to him through the people, places, and events of his life that led him to accept the talent that he had to become a doctor was going to outweigh and outgrow that early on dream of becoming a major league ball player. Tough stuff to grapple with sometimes when somebody might have big time visions of grandeur or multiple gifts and talents. You're not Quite sure which way to go, but God has a way of working things out, as they say, as you test. There's a book by Cardinal Pell called Test Everything. That's very important to do in the area of discernment. Try to touch base. That one, this one, a few others perhaps. See what you get back. It might give you a little indication of where God's nudging. Mother then addresses the issue of prayer not as a secret language. She says there are no shortcuts for getting what you want from God. There's no special language or set of code words for getting the answer you desire. I mention this because a lot of us think that there are some scriptural guarantees that God will come through with whatever we want if we simply ask, quote, in his name, unquote. There are so many people who call the network in a fury because they read our Lord's proclamation, quote, whatever you ask for in my name, I will do. John chapter 14, verse 13. They've asked for healings, new jobs, Cadillacs, and the rest, all in the name of Jesus. And when God hasn't delivered, they get into a spiritual huff. Asking in the name of Jesus is not simply a matter of name dropping. God doesn't have passwords or special handshakes or secret techniques for prayer. When Jesus says, whatever you ask for in my name, he means whatever you ask for in absolute unity with the Father's will. If there are two perfect prayers in Scripture, they are the Lord's Prayer and the prayer of Jesus during his agony in the garden. In both of these prayers, requests are made of the Father, but always with the exception that prayers be answered in accordance with God's will. In the Lord's Prayer, of course, he says, thy will be be done. And in Jesus' prayer in the garden, he made his painful request, take this cup from me, and then added, but let it be as you, not I, would have it. When you unite your will to the will of God, then and only then are you praying, quote unquote, in his name. While we're on the subject of misconceptions, there's a dangerous, misleading idea that it takes large amounts of faith to get a positive answer from God. 
If God in his wisdom determines that the best course of action or inaction is in accordance with your request, he will answer you positively. If there are obstacles to that outcome, he will work on them. If he deems that no is the appropriate answer or that wait is the appropriate answer, you will see that manifested in the present moment. The fact that you have turned to God, even in desperation, shows at least a glimmer of faith. And we should never forget that Jesus healed the faithful as well as the unfaithful alike. So we will never stop turning to God right here at WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. Have a great week. Have a great school year, all students. And let your light shine. Experience the incredible story of a woman who Time Magazine named the most influential Catholic woman in the United States. Rita Rizzo, the future Mother Angelica, grew up in a working-class neighborhood in Canton, Ohio during the Great Depression. Rita's father abandoned the family before she was five years old. Her early years of trial were compounded by a debilitating illness until she was healed by Jesus through a woman named Rhoda Wise. That healing set her life on a course that would ultimately change the world. Learn the amazing story of Rita Rizzo at the Mother Angelica Museum in her hometown of Canton, Ohio. Go to www.motherangelicamuseum.com. Be inspired. Plan your visit now at motherangelicamuseum.com. Let your light shine. That is what it's all about here at WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. But we need to hear your story. You want your voice to be his voice. That is making the faith known to others. Please, my number is 877-625-3727. Tim Kilcoin, TalkCatholic.com. St. Mother Teresa told us, your ministry is your work right where you are. Grab on to this microphone. God bless.